That was nice of you. Uh, so this is install NixOS Anywhere. Uh, it's changed a bit as I've been working on the talk, so it's kind of an exploration of how NixOS boots and some of the things that makes NixOS a bit unique in terms of distributions and how that can make it a little bit easier to get it installed in difficult places. Um, if you've tried to play with NixOS, you've probably noticed that uh, it's not offered on a lot of VPSs. Um, you, you know, you might not have a spare machine to get going with. You might not know how to install it. Um, so we'll take a look a little bit under the hood and see how that works and um, some of the things that make it special. Uh, so just a quick intro. Who am I? Uh, I'm Wes Payne. Thank you for coming to the talk. I'm a co-host with Jupiter Broadcasting on Linux Unplugged. If you've listened to that at all, you probably know that we found NixOS, I don't know, a year or two ago. And since then, it's, it's become a little bit of an obsession of ours. Um, I mean, I've, I've been in Linux for you know, over a decade now, and finding NixOS was really one of those moments that kind of reinvigorated the curiosity and the sort of, you know, that you first get a Linux install, or I remember like when I first, you know, staying up late in college and I got Arch installed and like it finally worked and I'd, I'd done it three times and it failed and like everything was going. That kind of energy, I think, really it is really there if you like Linux and you like learning new things and you like exploring new paradigms. Um, now, I should say, if you're going to actually try and play and learn with NixOS, get a spare machine that you don't need that's not in production that you can just kind of install it on. There is a GUI installer, so what we're going to do today is probably not what you're going to want to do for your first introduction to NixOS. Um, installing in a VM is also a great option because uh, there's a lot of edge cases. NixOS is great and it can be very powerful, um, but it does things very differently than a lot of traditional distributions. and so. If you're, trying, if you're used to using the Linux desktop, you will run into situations where, oh, right, I'm used to just downloading that dev package or that executable file. And that's going to look for things in places that NixOS isn't going to have them. Now, there's a lot of escape hatches, things like using flat packs and Steam runtime and a lot of things. But not having to figure that out on the fly as you're trying to get work done, doing it in a VM, doing it in a safe place where you have time to sort of learn all the edge cases, learn how to make it work. That, um, that's definitely one approach that can help make things stick a little bit more. So that's the disclaimer of like, don't do this for your first time, uh, but there can be a lot of fun under the hood. Uh, okay, so before we get into NixOS, we might want to talk about Nix a little bit itself. Um, Nix is a programming language, a functional programming language at that. Um, functional programming can mean a lot of things, but for the purposes of this talk, we mostly mean you use functions a lot. F functions are like a primary mechanism that you use to do things. They're first class, so you can create functions, you can assign functions to variables, you can pass functions around, and a lot of things are immutable. So you don't change something in place, you make a new version. But you don't have to super care about Nix at first, especially to play with Nix OS, but Nix is a lot of the magic under the hood that kind of makes NixOS possible and makes NixOS work. Um, so let's take a look. These, these slides right here, the slides are super minimal. We'll be a, spend a bunch of time in the terminal, but I wanted something up here. So if you look, you might be able to tell these slides right now, they're just in a home folder. This is a brand new Ubuntu 2404 install. Um, and so right now we're kind of using an index.html. We pulled that up in Firefox. Ah, that's not ideal. So maybe Nix can help us. Maybe we want a web server involved here. And that might show us a little bit about how Nix works. So here we've got some files. But the one we'll need to look at first is a flake.nix. Now, flakes are a whole other subject that we don't really need to get into today, except for their one mechanism, their one entry point to working with Nix. You don't have to learn flakes. You don't even need to use them to use NixOS. Probably shouldn't to just get started with. Um, but flake.nix is kind of how we're going to start. It declares our inputs and our outputs. You can think of it kind of like a, like a pip file for Python or um, a package.json for Node.js. It's a mechanism to declare and manage dependencies. So here at the top, um, we've got some inputs where we're grabbing Nix packages. Uh, Nix packages is a repository on GitHub that contains a whole bunch of packages that people have built for Nix. Um, one of the things about Nix as a language, so it's a programming language. Uh, it looks a lot like a lot of other programming languages. It has the normal stuff you'd want, right? It's got things like lists. It's got key value things like you might call an object in JavaScript or a dictionary in Python. But something that Nix has that a lot of other programming languages don't have 
uh, is the concept of a derivation. And that's because Nix is intended not only as a programming language, but also as a build system. Um, there's a lot of stuff under the hood about derivations, but what you really need to know is it's basically like build instructions. Um, it's not actually building it right then, but it's creating a set of instructions that you can then feed into the Nix tool chain, and that tells Nix how to ultimately build the package. Um, and we'll take a look at just a little minimal one here. There's a lot of stuff in here. You don't need a lot of it, so we'll just focus on pieces at a time. If we look right here, um, we've got something called talk. Uh, you'll see it's in some curly brackets there, and I can make it bigger if that would be helpful. <coughs> Maybe like that. Uh, so here we have talk. That's equal to packages.standardenv.makeDerivation. The specifics don't super matter, but we're calling that make derivation function. Oh, thank you. Uh, with a couple of parameters inside. So we're going we're gonna to say, what's the name of this? In this case, we're going to name it talk. Um, you can provide some source. And make derivation is how you kind of build packages. This is like the base level of how you tell Nix how to make something. Um, so in this case, we're going to try to package the talk. Uh, there's not a lot going on here. I'm actually building most of the talk outside of this. You could do the whole thing in Nix, but it seemed a little more complicated than was really worthwhile for this talk. Um, so in this folder, uh, I have a public folder. Uh, and that has the index.html. So this is just a static website, index.html. There's some assets here, CSS, images, node modules that it pulls in. These are reveal.js slides, but they're super minimal. So back over here, we see source. Uh, that can be a tarball. That can be something that you want to pull off GitHub. Uh, it can be all kinds of things. You just need to tell it, like, this is what you're working with, Nix. This is the files that we're going to be using for this particular build. Um, in this case, I'm just telling it the files that you want are in the, re the repository we're already in. Um, there's some stuff there about don't unpack, don't build. Those are options to tell it like, oh, this isn't a tarball. You don't need to extract it. Don't, don't waste your time. Uh, obviously, some stuff has a build phase. So if you're compiling a C program and you want to you know, actually turn the, the text file into an object file, you're going to need a compiler. That's going to happen in the build phase. But since my files are just a static HTML, don't need to do any building. So the only phase we actually have, and there's a bunch of phases. This is what makes Nix powerful. There's all kinds of customizations you can do. We're not doing them here. Uh, here we just have an install phase. Um, first things we do is we make a directory. Um, that out variable there, uh, it's just kind of like in bash, right? It, it's just a variable. It's uh, led with a dollar sign. And Nix magically sets that up for you. So when you're building your package in the derivation, Nix makes sure before it runs your little script and in install phase, it's assigned a value that it wants for out. And that's, that's the little contract you have to say, like, Nix says, do whatever you want to build your package, buddy. Uh, just make sure you put anything that you actually want to keep as outputs in this out folder. Uh, so we're going to make a folder there. And then we're just going to copy everything in our, public, in our public folder. So really, that's just me copying the index.html, copying the CSS, and that's all going to go. Um, that's all well and good. We can, we can take an example here. Uh, Nix Flake Show. This is going to show us some of the various outputs we have. There's a lot in there because there's support for different uh, architectures. Uh, you'll see there's AR64 Darwin, blah, blah, blah. Um, for this, I'm, this is a x86-64 Linux package. Um, so we can ask Nix to build talk. There's a couple different, there's three packages here, default, serve, and talk, way down at the bottom. Uh, talk is just the slides itself. Uh, serve is what we're going to see in a moment, which is a little shell script to help actually serve those files. Uh, and default is just something you can assign. I've set that to serve. Those are identical. Uh, so we went ahead. Nix, Nix was nice enough to build talk for us. You can see it figures out that it doesn't really need to do much if we, if we build it again. Uh, and by default, it makes a little sim link called result. And you can see result points to uh, a terrible looking path. <laughs> That's because uh, Nix takes the hash of the inputs. So whatever you're building, you tell it some inputs, takes the hash of those inputs and uses it in the file name. Uh, and this is some of the magic that lets Nix build multiple versions and not have them conflict on each other. So you might have two different packages. They might need two totally different versions of GCC or of Python. Um, and because the inputs that you use for them will be different, they'll have different hashes and they can all exist. 
Um, and in the Nix world, the Nix store is basically everything. Uh, and it's a mutable store where everything is named by its hash, um, and everything you want lives in there. So on a Nix system, pretty much everything is just a symlink into that Nix store. Uh, so when you want to poke around and actually see, like, what is this thing, the Nix store is where you're going to look. Uh, in this case, we can see that if I uh, look at the result, ls is kind enough to go follow that symlink. Um, and it just has the files that are the same in public. So if I ls public, same thing. So easy, really not doing much. All Nix did was sort of copy the files I told it to copy into the Nix store. What if we want to serve those files, though? Well, that's where we can take things to the next level. Up top, we have the, the slides derivation we were just talking about, the talk there. Um, and then one thing that's super handy about Nix is it's got a lot of built-ins if you want to just write shell scripts. Uh, one handy one is packages.write shell application. Um, that'll actually run your shell script through shell check for you, which is a, a wonderful little linter for bash scripts that reminds you if you do something weird or bad or hard to read in bash. Um, but its main functionality is to let you declare inputs. And that says, like, hey, Nix, I need these packages. I depend on them, just like you would in a programming language when you're you know, you're making a Python project, you tell pip, like, oh, I need the request library. Um, Nix lets you do that, but for like all of the packages that are in a Linux distribution. So your project can depend not only on pip and Python and requests, but it can also depend on htop and go and uh, core utils if you need that. Um, so in this case, the runtime inputs that we're going to need, well, we want a web server because we're going to try to serve this index.html file. Uh, so let's use Caddy. That's a simple one. NixOS has great support for Nginx. There's traffic is packaged. Pretty much any web server you could want, but Caddy is super simple and is totally sufficient for what we need here. Uh, and of course, since I'm going to serve the talk, well, we're also going to need the talk. So that's the second runtime input there. Uh, and then the text argument down a little bit farther down is actually the contents of the script body. So this is just the same thing that you'd put in the bash script. Um, and in this case, it's just a one-liner. We're going to run caddy. Uh, we're telling it to be a file server for us. Uh, we're going to tell it a port to listen on, in this case, 9999, which for some reason is the default port I use whenever I need a random port. Uh, and then we're going to tell it where to serve those files out of. That's where the dash dash root comes in. Uh, and in this case, we're going to tell it uh, that we want it to be pointed to talk. The uh, dollar sign with brackets there is kind of like in bash. It's a variable substitution. So that goes and looks up the, the value from talk in the runtime inputs and interpolates it in there. So now uh, we can go ahead and build that. So before we ran nix build talk, and in this case, we're going to want to build serve. Otherwise, totally the same command. The uh, dot there, uh, that's just referring to the present directory. The hash is a little separator that says, like, OK, well, we're going to use the uh, outputs you got in the current directory and then tell me which thing to build. So before we were building talk, now we're building serve. Uh, and we'll see that the uh, result there, that's just the default thing. Whenever you call Nix build, it outputs a result symlink. You can also tell it not to do that. You can also tell it to use a different name if you want. That's just the default. So in this case, it's made a new result for us. And you'll see it, it goes to another Nix store, another super long path. But instead of talk, it's serve. And if we actually go look at what's in there, oh, well, there's just a bin folder. And under there, there's an executable script named serve. Let's take a look at that. OK, so Nix was kind enough to make this for us. You'll see it handled um, building in an actual path for the interpreter there. We didn't have to worry about that. Um, this means we get that basically for free. Uh, it's also set in some standard uh, nice things to have in a bash script, like pipe fail and error exit. We didn't have to specify those either. And then those runtime inputs. How do those work? Um, well, Nix is going to take the paths of all the inputs we specified and put that on the path there. So that when this shell script runs, it knows about all of the executables that we've told it, but no other ones. Um, it'll just look there. I mean, other stuff on the path, sure, but nothing else in the Nix store. It adds just those packages so that those will work. And then at the bottom, it basically just runs the script we told it to. Uh, runs caddy, file server, listen, root. And then you'll see here, instead of that variable we had in the Nix file, uh, it's actually expanded out to the actual path there that we were looking at before. So. 
caddy will go serve from that directory, and it's going to go see the index.html files. So we should be able, if this all worked, now there's some noise there from caddy starting up, uh, but mm, warnings and infos doesn't sound like an error to me. <laughs> we should be able now to go to localhost port 9999 in the web browser, and there's the talk. So it's pretty simple. Um, this kind of thing is basic Nix, um, but it gives you a little flavor of how you build stuff. So what the, the wonderful folks behind Nix packages and Nix OS have done is basically followed that kind of steps, but for everything you might expect to have in a Linux distribution and a whole bunch more. So there's 100,000 plus packages in Nix packages now. Um, you can install basically whatever you want with Nix. And we're, talk we're gonna talk more about Nix OS for the rest of the talk, but um, Nix is super useful just as a secondary package manager. Uh, I use it on my work MacBook. Super great there as an alternative to Homebrew. Some stuff's great from Homebrew. There's a lot of stuff that you can get in Nix that's a little faster to install and a little more lightweight. Uh, and it's also great just on an Ubuntu system, right? Like we've been using Nix so far in the talk. This is an Ubuntu 2404 box. You don't have to go full Nix OS to still get a lot of the benefits of Nix. Um, and it's got, because it's got so many packages, like if you don't want it to install it from the repo, or maybe you're, you've are you got an LTS server, you're mostly happy with using LTS packages, but you want a couple of different things that either aren't packaged, or you'd have to use a PPA for, or the packaged version is just a little more behind than you like, Nix can be a nice way to kind of sideload that onto your distro. So let's see. Okay, so what about NixOS then? And actually, for some, for some reason, it didn't seem to have all the slides there. We could, we could, let's see. Uh, let's see the actual slides repo. One of my favorite things to do is to watch Wes troubleshoot. <laughs> <laughs> the best entertainment. Okay, so resources, public. All right, so let's just do this one more time. <laughs> All right, one more time. We'll just see if this works. Not doesn't really matter. Uh, okay, great. And then result bin serve. There we go. Thank you. Huh? No. All right. Well, I probably just didn't update it all the way when I built things earlier. Uh, that's fine. We've got it. We've got the fallback here. Uh, so. Back to actual Nix OS. Here's a sample Nix OS configuration. The magic of Nix OS is you've got a single file, configuration.nix. It looks kind of a lot like JSON, except you can use comments, so that's really nice. Um, and unlike YAML, indentation doesn't matter. Um, you do have to put semicolons a lot of the places, but you get over that pretty quick. Um, and this is a single file to configure basically everything about your OS. Um, if you're an Ansible or Chef or other sort of configuration management user, maybe you've been exposed to this, an idea that you can have a set of files or one file that says like, here's all the programs I need, here's all the settings I need. <coughs> NixOS has that same idea. Um, so we can kind of see here, I'm using system dboot. That's saying like, yes, you can add stuff. You can mess with my EFI variables. Uh, I would like networking, thank you very much. I can set a host name, I can set a time zone. And for a lot of this stuff, um, like if you just start playing with NixOS, especially in a virtual machine, all you really need to do is have keys and values. So you kind of say like, yes, I want this program on, no, I don't want that. And you'll get really far before you really need to write any sort of complicated Nix expression. So a lot of this is just configuring the settings available in NixOS. Turning on Pipewire, um, I'd like Flatpak, please. Firefox would be great. Uh, down here, I'm making a user account. Now, in real life, you wouldn't want to just have your password in your uh, in your configuration file, but for the purposes of this, I thought Linux Fest Northwest 2024 would be kind of an appropriate password. Um, and then we'll turn on SSH. We'll enable Flakes. I have a question. Yeah. Is there some way of, of having a uh, things like secrets brought in from a separate file? Yes, definitely. There's a whole bunch of um, secret handling options. A lot of good ones, uh, several prominent ones. So 
you, we can talk after if you'd like, and I can point you out a couple, but there's definitely ways to handle secrets in Nix, but kind of outside the scope of this talk. Um, and then I'd like to install a couple packages. I like to have NeoVim, let's have that, let's have Bat, so we can get some colorized cat output for the demos and stuff. But that's about it. Now, one thing that I find really handy about Nix uh, is it has a REPL, uh, or a read, evaluate, print, loop. Um, if you've used Python or things like that, right? it's just kind of like a bash shell or a shell command line interface, but for a programming language. And when you're first getting started with Nix, you're trying to figure things out, troubleshoot stuff. Why is, why is this syntax wrong? Or did this build like I think it is? Um, the REPL is super useful. So we'll go ahead and uh, load the stuff from this folder. Um, we'll now see that we've got packages. And we'll see, those are the ones we were building before. So we've got talk, we've got serve. Um, there's the default there. So if we look at serve here, Nix is going to evaluate that. And we'll see that it output a derivation. And this is kind of where the functional stuff comes in, right? It doesn't, it doesn't just build it right there. It outputs the, the build plan for you. And then it's actually an entirely separate step to go then say, oh, actually, uh, Nix, please build that for me. You can do that here in the REPL with colon B. Uh, and now it's actually going to go out and talk to the Nix store and figure out all the dependencies and build it. And then it shows you here, oh, yep, this derivation produced the following outputs. And it shows you that, oh, yeah, somewhere in the Nix store, uh, that's what it produced. Um, also in this file, though, we have Nix OS configurations. Uh, the thing you were looking at before, I've just called GNOME Desktop because that's the default that I went with for the OS. Um, if we take a look here, you can see that one thing that's great about the REPL is you can just sort of explore around. You can see like what actually is this? What does Nix think of it? What are the options contained? There's a lot of ways to search for that. Uh, the Nix package search has good mechanisms for doing so. Um, but I find just going to the REPL and sort of poking around um, is a great way to explore. So in this case, um, we want to go into config system build. Give it a moment. You can do it, little buddy. As it takes its sweet time. Oh, yep, that's a good sign. I grabbed a random NixOS config, so there's some warnings in here from old package options. Well, how much did I change here? I didn't think it would quite take this long. I tried to preload as much as I could here. Uh, there we go. Yeah, okay, so we can see that under build, there's a bunch of stuff. Build is kind of the place where a lot of things go. Um, there's a boot stage, there's file systems, there's the Etsy, uh, there's the kernel version that you want, there's all kinds of things. The system D units that are going to happen, man pages. But the thing about Nix, uh, Nix OS that's really neat is there's one single attribute here called top level. And that top level system is everything. So it's one place to start, and it specifies everything about your entire system. Um, and you can just build it. And where this changes from using something like Ansible or other ways to configure your system. Uh, so I just installed 2404. And when you go through a traditional distro install, right, you kind of click through the installer, and it extracts a bunch of stuff onto your disk, and then you kind of go in, and you imperatively configure it, right? You go like, okay, well, I've got the defaults, and now I need to go configure SSH the way that I like it. Now I need to go in, add, and change my favorite shell. Um, with NixOS, you just do that from your config file, and then it's done. It's done for the life of that configuration. And when you build it, it builds a static set of files that have all of that baked in. You can tar them up, you can take them with you, it's done, and then you just kind of need to deploy it. There's a lot of deployment mechanisms, but it's really neat to not have to go do everything at runtime. You don't have to like spin up a virtual machine, run your Ansible script, and then capture the output of that into like a blessed golden image vagrant style. Um, you can take this and turn it into a virtual machine. You can take this and turn it into a Docker container. You can take this and ship it and stick it on a VPS somewhere and just have it run. It's super flexible. So if we take a look here, um, one thing I meant to point out is if we build our talk again, 
Nix, because Nix tracks all the dependencies, it's able to tell you about all the things it needs. And this is one of the things that makes Nix OS really powerful is because it's built on Nix, uh, it gets all that stuff for free. So here I'm taking a look at all the dependencies for our, um, the project. And it doesn't have much. A lot of this is just the standard environment that you get anyway. So you get TZ data, and you, you get Bash, you get GCC. Um, but you'll see Caddy there in the list. Um, you'll, see, you'll see the talk slides in there. Um, but Nix has this idea of a closure, which is everything that is depended on by your system. And when we built that top level attribute, um, that produces the closure of the entire operating system. Every single file that you could possibly need is all in there. Um, so let's build that again. Is, is the uh, top level what makes NixOS different than a uh, package? Uh, yes, in some ways. Um, it, it's the thing that joins everything else together. I mean, when you're running it as just Nix and you want to run it on top of or something like that. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. So if you're going to do that, you wouldn't really need this. Um, one thing that's really... Thing, but if it's top level, I mean, the rest of things from below top level might very well be the same. It's, yeah. Is that, what, is that what you're saying? Is top level is partially uh, what marks the difference? Yeah, well, that you're even able to do something like top level. Um, so what, what's kind of cool here is, like, we can build this entire system. We can get all the output files, but we didn't have to be on NixOS. Um, a lot of times when you're in NixOS, you would actually kind of just go, uh, you'd make a change to your configuration right there on the machine, then you run NixOS rebuild switch, and it just automatically adds the new package. It stops or starts the system D services that it needs to do, whatever needs to happen. Um, but you can do it all ahead of time. You can have this run in CI and output all the files as a blessed configuration and download them. Um, like, it, there's a lot of different options. But top level is basically the thing that says, like, this is um, each top level then. You can have multiple systems, right? So if I have one system that has Vim installed and then I update the configuration, I remove Vim and I add Nano, um, when I rebuild top level, that's going to produce a new output that will, have, will be totally different. And that's kind of what lets you have multiple systems in play and even roll, switch between them as you'd like to. Um, but that's, that's from hardware config all the way down. Yes. Yeah. Um, so there's a hardware config in here, which, which we don't need to super look at. No. But I mean, when it says it's, it's read it, when you read down it and change, change just uh, the text editor, yep. Um, that the, the new top level is encompasses everything. Yes, exactly. The next one. Yep. Um, so we can take a look at what's inside as well. So. Um, when you run NixOS Rebuild, if you don't use Flakes, you kind of you probably won't see all of this. Um, but when you run NixOS Rebuild, it's doing the same thing. It's looking at your NixOS configuration. It's going to the GNOME desktop. That's the name of that particular one. You can have a whole bunch of systems with different names. Uh, and it's going to build the top level. So this is kind of doing it uh, by hand. So we'll just build it really quick. Well, hopefully really quick. Close now. There we go. Okay, uh, so if we go in and look in result, we'll see what's kind of inside top level here. Um, and you'll see like it's produced um, this activate script. It's produced the firmware that you might need when you're booting the system. It's produced the init script. Um, this is just a quick look at the init script that kind of starts things up. But one thing that's kind of neat about NixOS and one of the things that's like going on with top level uh, is that you'll see that this init script, it's got its dependencies hard-coded into it. Um, so NixOS tries to resolve a lot of stuff at compile time. Uh, it's why, for instance, it's a great OS to run ZFS on. Um, any ZFS users might know that oftentimes as the kernel advances, stuff breaks, uh, and the ZFS project is often playing catch-up to the latest and greatest Linux kernel. So you kind of have to be a little careful on systems, not on Ubuntu, because they've, they've made sure that matches and they build the ZFS module themselves. But on other Linux systems, you've got DKMS in play. You might have issues where you're like, the new kernel just dropped on a Sunday, and now I can't use ZFS, or I have to make sure I don't use that kernel. Uh, NixOS, because it does all this dependency tracking, it knows internally which kernels are blessed as compatible with OpenZFS. And so if your system tries to build with a kernel that doesn't work, and you've also specified that you want to use ZFS in your config, it's going to break right there. And that's all a part of its sort of like build time dependency resolution. So when this init script runs, 
it's got a hard coded version of systemd. It's got hard, that systemd has hard coded versions of all of the systemd units. Uh, and all of those live in that one flat Nix store. And so that's kind of what makes the Nix OS rollback magic work. Um, you get different bootloader entries, and all you have to do is tell it to point. All you have to do is say, hey, init, go to this particular init, start this thing when you start up, and all of the rest follows pretty much automatically. Um, we can take a look at the boot parameters here, too. We have a boot.json file here, which kind of tells you some of the parameters for this top-level derivation. So you'll see it specifies a very particular init. Um, and when you go and like make your grub config or your system D stuff, that init command line there is going to be what's passed on the kernel command line. So it's going to load the kernel. It's going to load the init ramfs, also both specified right here, uh, initrd and kernel. Those are, those are for this build. You could have other builds that have totally separate initrds or kernels. Um, and just passing that in it starts the whole system. And then if we built another one, we added a new package to it, we would get a totally different in it, which we could do. Uh, so if we go here, we go to configuration, uh, let's add nano. Let's build it real quick. You can do it. This one I didn't pull down, so it has to go, you know, go grab nano and stuff. There we go. Great. So if we look up here, uh, we'll see that init starts uh, slash nick slash store slash nzb7. Um, and then if we look at our new boot.json, slash nix, slash store, slash zero q f. And again, that's because it hashes the inputs. And we changed our configuration.nix. Sure, we only added one package. But to nix, that means that the entire system basically needs to be rebuilt. Now, it's smart enough under the hood to realize, like, oh, all the other programs you want, those didn't change. So, like, let's just keep and cache those. Um, but you'll see, like, it's starting a new init, which is going to point to a different version of systemd, which is ultimately the same under the hood. Um, but it's things like this that kind of like make NixOS so flexible. Also, one thing I should have pointed out here in the configuration.nix. Oh, actually, it's in the flake. Excuse me. Uh, so we were trying to serve our talk earlier, right? We got Caddy going. It was serving our talk for us. Um, but in the NixOS system that we're going to have in just a moment, well, I'd kind of like that functionality to be replicated. And it'd be nice if instead of me having to manually run the .serve script, uh, well, like, what if systemd could do that? Uh, NixOS and systemd are just bread and butter. Um, because NixOS lets you configure so much stuff ahead of time, it plays really nicely with the flexibility of systemd. So you can kind of like figure out all the units that you want. And so a lot of stuff that you kind of do with shell scripts or by hand on other distributions, NixOS does via building systemd or asking systemd to do it. Um, in this case, though, we're really just going to make a simple uh, systemd configuration. Um, so here, down at the bottom, we want a new systemd services. We're going to call it talk. So we say systemd.services.talk, uh, and then we're going to give it some attributes. So we're going to tell it it's, it's wanted by multiuser.target, which is just the systemd way of saying, hey, please run this when the system starts up. Uh, and then we're going to give it a service configuration. And if you've ever looked at a systemd unit file, then you'll kind of recognize these names. They're the same stuff that you put in the systemd, uh, you know, the systemd units. Um, you just get to do it with Nix config. Line 62 says serve package in curly braces. How does that, where does that come from? Where is that? Oh, yeah. Um, and I'll, I see system above it as well. Like, are they like reserved words and stuff? Uh, no. So in this case, um, so we made serve here. And this is one of our package outputs, right? So there's, um, and that's what we built before. Uh, and then in here, we're defining our GNOME desktop configuration. Most of the logic is contained in that configuration.nix file. Um, but with flakes, you kind of get a little bit here at the top, too, that's, that wraps it and sort of uh, exports it so that it's like publicly consumable. Um, and so right here, there's a let lock. And this is how you do um, variable assignments. Not really variables, it's just bindings. It's, 
immutably binding a name to a value. Uh, so in this case, we're telling it that in this system we're building is x86-64 Linux, because it's an Intel ThinkPad. Uh, and then here, we're giving ourselves a handy little variable so we don't have to type this longer here. So I'm making a variable called serve package, and I'm telling it that it's referring to a package that I've made in this file uh, for this system called serve. And then we can refer to that down here when we are building our systemd service. Uh, we tell it, like, well, what do we actually want to run? Well, let's run that serve script. And because of the way we made it, Nix puts it under, like, slash bin slash serve, so it kind of plays nicely with the way paths work in a lot of other programs that have slash bin in their, in their setup. Um, so if things go right, uh, this should be running for us uh, right there when the system starts up. OK, so problem, though, we're running Ubuntu here, right? We're not running Nix OS. There's a really neat piece of functionality that's powered by a cool fact about Nix. Uh, the Nix store is basically where everything lives. And that means Nix doesn't actually need anything besides the Nix store to boot. Uh, it doesn't need Etsy setup. There, there's a minimal setup. But it doesn't need slash bin. It doesn't need any of that. As long as everything is contained in the Nix store and you've started the right in it, it can figure out the rest. Um, and we can actually kind of show that uh, if we, let's see. Uh, so I've made a uh, tempfs, so just a tempfs ram uh, disk on slash mount. And if we, okay, I'm going to build our NixOS system again really quick, which will just give us, uh, replace our sim link. Almost there. You get used to doing this a lot with NixOS. But it's worth it, because it kind of catches a lot of stuff that you might mess up at compile time. Would, would it be faster without those errors? Uh, no, but it would be less verbose. OK. <laughs> uh, okay, so we see we've got that built here. Um, and then we've got. Now, in general, installing NixOS is sort of step one, format your system, kind of left to you. Uh, there's a tool I'll mention at the end called Disco, which lets you do that declaratively if you'd like to get fancy, and it's a really neat tool. Um, but by and large, kind of like with an Arch install, or if you just want to customize your stuff for any install, set up your system how you'd like with the partitions you'd like, EFI, legacy, whatever. Um, the next is to make your configuration, including the hardware config, tell it you know, what you need for the system, what packages you want, what users you want, etc. cetera. Uh, and then the last step uh, is to run NixOS install. And NixOS install is really just a bash script. Um, it's not even that long of a bash script. There, this is a bunch of like just the args that it takes there, and then just a little bit more. So it's like a couple hundred lines at most. Um, you give NixOS install your configuration. You tell it where you'd like to install it. And it does the rest. So unlike the old Arch, I know there's Arch installer these days, but unlike the old Arch install where you like had a set of wiki steps that you had to go do, uh, because you have the configuration file, Nix has already done that. Everything's configured. Your locale is set up. All, all your users are set up, all, all, the, all the stuff you might need. Um, so in this case, we can just go ahead and install it. Now, right now, there's nothing under slash mount. Um, and then this is a little bit of an unusual command just because um, we're not going to build a full system just here. I just want to show that it doesn't actually need anything under slash nix. Uh, so we're going to tell it a uh, system that's going to refer to the system we already built. It can build one for you if you haven't built it. In this case, we've just built it. We have a reference to it. We don't need to rebuild it. Um, a lot of the times, because you probably don't want to put your root password in, your, in there, you can do it other ways, but uh, it'll ask you for a root password when you install, which we don't need to do here. And then for the moment, we'll get to bootloader, but for the moment, we don't want to add a bootloader. So this is just going to install the files and not kind of touch the system otherwise. And uh, yeah, so under, under mount is totally empty. We'll run NixOS install. And then it'll take just a sec as it copies a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, this is the bulk of it, is copying all the stuff that we've depended on from the Nix store on the host system to the new Nix store that it's setting up on our installation drive. And you can kind of see as it scrolls by, it's a whole bunch of GTK stuff, GNOME, systemd units. Hey, there we go. It wasn't too, too long. 
Um, and now, if we look under slash mount, there's not much there, right? Like when you go and install Ubuntu, there's a whole bunch more files on in your root uh, than there is in this case. Uh, there is uh, something under Etsy, but that's just to tell it that it's a NixOS system. There's literally just an uh, empty file called NixOS that identifies it to itself so it knows. It'll refuse to do some things if like you don't have that there because it doesn't want to break a non-NixOS system. Uh, and then otherwise, it's a whole bunch of stuff under the next door. That is everything that that system depends on. Um, what's neat is you don't have to do anything else to boot this thing. I mean, you still need to set up your bootloader, but as long as you give it the right kernel that was specified in top level, give it that init ramfs, and then tell it the actual init script that you want to start, which has all the other stuff hard-coded into it that, just, that we just built, um, it'll set everything else up for you. And you can see this by using NixOS Enter, uh, which is actually forked from long ago the Arch Chroot script, if you, anyone's ever used that. And it's just a Chroot on steroid that lets you go, like let's say you want to go do some maintenance on a Nix system from another installer from a live CD, NixOS Enter lets you go step inside that NixO, NixOS install. So we can do that here. Yeah, probably that, huh? Oh, yeah, right. Okay, here we go. What? I thought I installed that. Oh, well, I do have another terminal open. That's probably where I meant to do it, huh? There we go. All right. Uh, it defaults to knowing that you probably put it under uh, slash mount. You can specify if you, have, you put it under a different directory. Uh, so now we'll see there's more stuff here now. And that's because every time Nix starts or any time you enter into a uh, Chiroot, if these things weren't there, Nix's activation script is going to figure that out and set it up for you. And this is kind of the power. Um, we're not going to touch on it today, but there's a really neat concept of impermanence in NixOS, which is the idea that you like, the only thing you keep that you allow changes to is the Nix store, and everything else in your system you reboot. Like anytime you reboot, you just wipe it. Uh, some people use like ZFS and kind of, you know, roll back to an empty snapshot, or you can have your whole system run in RAM out of tempfs, and so when you reboot, those things are just wiped, and then Nix builds it all fresh for you. Um, and NixOS is great already for this kind of thing because unlike some other configuration management systems where let's say I install the package and now I don't really want that package on my servers anymore, well, I probably need to explicitly specify a policy that makes sure that it gets removed if we want to handle those legacy systems. Um, with NixOS, when you remove it from your configuration and you switch to the new thing, it just won't be available to any of those programs. You won't see it anymore. Uh, but that doesn't prevent you from leaving cruft in your home directory or adding something under slash opt that you kind of forgot about, but it turns out now you're relying on it for some of your services. So if you have an impermanent setup and you wipe everything, uh, kind of make sure that you really can't do that to yourself. So it's sort of a safety measure. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's what the ability of Nix to figure out and just set up the whole sort of standard user environment that the rest of the system expects right here um, is all powered by its ability to run just from the next door with nothing else. Um, that also powers a concept that we're going to talk about now called lustrating. It's a strange word. Uh, here's a strange definition. It's a verb to purify, sacrifice, ceremonial washing, or some other ritual action. Um, and I think that's a sort of a pointed comment here where they're suggesting that, like, you know, your old Linux install, it's impure. Let's get rid of it. Let's clean things up. Let's turn it into NixOS. And that's what Lustrate is about. It's a, it's a feature that actually lives um, inside the stage one init script. And what it lets you do um, is install from an existing Linux distribution. Now, Nix does that really well because as we've just seen, I just installed Nix to like a random directory in my file system. So if you have any other Linux system that you've booted into, you can use that to install, install Nix somewhere. But what if you don't have a separate partition or you know it's on a VPS and you know, you're just running, this is all you have access to, and you want to wipe the install that's currently on there and replace it with Nix. Well, that's what Lustrate lets you do. Uh, let's not spill over my laptop, but let's see if we can turn this thing into a NixOS install. Okay, so. Uh, Shut them out, yeah, build config. Great, great. 
Now, the manual has steps for this stuff. There's a wonderful NixOS manual with all kinds of info. Definitely a great place to start. Um, and it's got things for how to handle this. Um, but for some systems, there are some updates needed. So there's an open issue um, on GitHub. And I'm going to use some of these steps because they are super handy. So we've already gone ahead and built ourselves an XOS configuration. That step's done. Uh, now uh, we need to actually go tell the NixOS system about our configuration. Um, so NixOS has these various profiles. One of them is the system profile. And this is kind of what lets you, because each top level is distinct, you know, we, we added a package, we got a new top level. Uh, system and the various system versions are each just a named symlink that points to those different top level entries. And this kind of gives you the top level entry point where you can say like, oh, well, system one is the version that doesn't have nano. And then system two is the version that does have nano. But it's just symlinks into the next door to those built top levels. Um, so since we manually built ourselves a NixOS system, we're going to manually make sure that we've told it like this is the config that we want. This is kind of telling NixOS's environment like which version are you, am I going to be today? Well, we're going to tell you which version. And we do that uh, with this command here, which isn't super important, uh, except that we do have to do it. Um, OK, so for, for the remainder of this, we're we don't care about the stuff under slash, slash mount. We're going to do this all on the file system for this OS. So I the first thing I did, installed Ubuntu 2404. Then I installed Nix. Uh, if you do want to install Nix, I recommend the Determinant Systems installer. Uh, it's built with a bunch of Rust in there. Super easy. You can curl, pipe, to bash. I mean, obviously, go read the script. It's, it's pretty easy to read. Um, but hopefully, it's the last curl, pipe, bash you need to do uh, because pretty much everything else is packaged in Nix packages. So you'll have it that way. Um, so I installed Nix. That let us kind of do all the stuff we've been playing with. Um, and now we're going to tell it. Right here, we're going to say Nix profile install. I want to install it to the one, the official system profile. And then that long string at the bottom is just referring to the top level, to the NixOS configuration that we've got. Now it does some more stuff. It's going to check to make sure that it, our uh, configuration, so you'll see these error messages one more time. Maybe after the talk, I'll actually update that option. We'll find out. There we go. Oh, it looks like there was one already when I was testing this. So, but that'll be a nice excuse to kind of see what I'm talking about here. Uh, you'll see these are just sim links that point into the next store. And so that means that we can remove them, which we'll do really quick just to keep things clean. And do it one more time, which should do what we want. Yeah, what does it actually say? Uh, XKB variant, right. OK, so there we go. Back at it. We see we've got system pointing to system one link. And then that's pointing into our actual uh, entry in the Nix store. So from there. We've done a lot. The system's almost ready to go. But what about a bootloader, right? Um, we're going to need one of those. Uh, we're also going to need to set some things up to tell NixOS that we want to illustrate the system, and it knows to do some of its magic. Uh, so to do that, there's a special file that we're going to do. And again, this is happening on the actual Ubuntu install. Uh, so we touch two files. We touch etsy slash nixos, which we saw before. That's a special file that tells the system, yes, OK, you are nixos. Or in this case, you're about to be nixos. Uh, and then another file, nixos underscore lustrate. Uh, and that's the sort of magic flag that says, like, yes, do the, do the lustrate procedure and, I guess, destroy my old Linux system and replace it with nixos. So pretty easy. Um, and then um, what you can do is add files uh, into NixOS Lustrate. Uh, and this is probably unnecessary uh, to do it with T, because we're already root. But yeah, there we go. Oh, yeah, there's, I suppose there's a few of them in there, because I've been practicing. There. 
There we go. Just to get that back in a more pure state. Uh, okay. Uh, so this is just telling it to anything you put in Etsy NixOS Lustrate, you just need the file to exist, and then every, anything you put underneath of it is going to tell Lustrate to keep. So if there's any files you want to keep from your old system before you go and turn it into a NixOS system, add them there. So like if we wanted to keep a particular folder under our home directory, or you had stuff under op that you really wanted to make sure made it onto the new system, that's a mechanism to keep it there. In this case, uh, we just want to make sure we don't overwrite stuff we've put in Etsy NixOS. Not super important for our use case, but usually something you want, because that's where you've got your configuration.nix file stored, for example. Um, uh, now, this is the bit that the guide could be a little clear on, more clear on. I think it's only set up for legacy boot, and this is an EFI system. So we need to do a few things to clean up because we're going to replace our bootloader. So uh, first thing we're going to do is move slash boot to boot.back. Get the old stuff, the Ubuntu cruft out of the way. Grub, who needs that? Um, we'll make ourselves a new slash boot. This will be the NixOS slash boot. This is where things start to get dangerous because uh, the system's probably not bootable right now. Um, oh yeah, so this is an EFI system. So we've got our EFI stuff mounted uh, under the old boot.back. Let's get rid of that. And then let's mount it under our new setup. So I'm just gonna, it's an NVMe system. So, you know, dev, NVMe, blah, blah, blah. We're gonna mount that. That's my first partition, which is a FAT32 EFI partition. So now that's mounted, ready for NixOS. Um, and then one, let's see, let's pull up a new terminal here. If I could type my password, that would help. There's a bunch of stuff in here because I use the system as a test laptop. Um, but because there's this boot folder, which is like the default EFI bootloader, it's going to complain that we're overriding that. So we're just going to preemptively move that to a dot back as well. Yeah, great. And then the final step here. We've already got everything defined, right? We built that top level. It contained the kernel that it needed. It contained the init RAMFS. It contained the kernel param lines and the init script to run. But it hasn't actually done the, this is the stuff where you're actually, you're breaking out of the functional world and going to the imperative world. Like we actually need to write bootloader files to the disk if it's ever going to boot. So um, we can pass NixOS install bootloader. Uh, and then we can tell it we want to switch to the configuration boot. This is just a fancy command that says, like, NixOS, please install your bootloader and make this particular system that we just told you to use the system to boot into. There we go. Great. There's a bunch of warnings in there, but it created the files it needed to, uh, created an EFI boot entry. It's going to set that as the default. There's some warnings there, but none of those super matter for what we're doing. And now... If you all think we're ready, we're going to reboot. <laughs> Will it work? I don't know. Let's find out. I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> I know, right? I was kind of curious how that would go. <laughs> okay. I see my bootloader over here. Okay, so I've got a NixOS systemd bootloader. I guess that's not being mirrored out, but that's a good sign. I'm just hitting enter on the default entry. I see systemd starting up. That's a good sign. Uh huh. Oh, yeah, and here we go. I got a GNOME login screen. Should be Linux Fest Northwest 2024 as the password. And there we go. Uh, no, I don't need a tour. And there we go. And then if we look, um, because we asked it to, we should have that serve set up. Uh, yeah, sure, web can be the default browser. Why not? <laughs> And there we go. Cat is running. System is configured. 
Uh, so as homework, there's another project that I was hoping to demo, but they made some breaking changes recently. It's called NixOS Anywhere. Um, it kind of takes this to the next level. Like if you have a VPS set up and you want to just wipe it and turn it, you can do this on a VPS and it works great, but maybe you'd want to do it in an automated fashion. You want to hook into something like Terraform. Uh, NixOS Anywhere is a great little script that kind of, it first SSHs into your box, uh, uh, then it k-execs itself into a little environment that has NixOS tools. Uh, and that's where the kernel actually just starts a new kernel without rebooting. Topic for another time or listen to Linux Unplugged. Um, I talk about it way too much there. Uh, then it uses disco to declaratively wipe the VPS disk, put in the, configura the, per uh, the partitioning you want, uh, and then it actually runs basically what we just did to use NixOS to install, to install NixOS and reboot. So, because NixOS can just build things ahead of time very smartly, you can pretty much install it wherever you want. And there's a lot of fun options to get yourself into trouble, like trying to do it live right here. So thank you all for uh, watching. And uh, come back, because we're going to do a live Linux Unplugged here in the room uh, after lunch. Mm -hmm.